I'd like to invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the second half of the Old Testament. We're going to be today in a book of the Bible called Micah. Micah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, that part of the Bible. If you might find it more helpful, go to the table of contents and look up Micah. All right, it's a small book of the Bible in the Old Testament, but it's a great book of the Bible, and I'm looking forward to teaching from there to you today. Now, many of you know that we've been involved in a study that we've called Hit Singles, and we're taking some time this summer to learn some specific verses, and my hope is that we'll come to understand what the verses mean, but more than that, I've challenged our church to commit to memory the verses we've studied so far. Our study started in Psalm 119, verse 111. How many of you took the time to Memorize that verse, huh? Good. Is it on the screen behind me? That is what you call a cheat sheet, all right? But uh, why don't we say that verse together? The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And that's what this series is all about, is trying to get God's word into our heart so that we can live our lives for his glory. And the verse we're studying today comes from this great book of the Bible called Micah. And I'll tell you a little bit about Micah, the one who this book was named for. He was a prophet of God. He was faithful. He served the Lord for about 25 years, and he had a great impact for for the cause that God had in his life. But we know that being called to be a prophet is not an easy calling. He was raised outside of Jerusalem, southwest outside of Jerusalem, and and he would get a word from God, and and he would preach that word. Uh, I would be similar to Micah in this regard. I get in the word of God, and I do my very best to share God's word with you, but Micah would hear from God, and, and he would share that way. That's how God delivered his truth at that time. And again, being a prophet, God would tell the prophet what to say. The prophet would say it, and guess what? People didn't always enjoy hearing what it is God had to say through his prophet. In fact, one time Micah preached the word God gave him to give, and and the people heard what he had to say, and here's what they had to say after his sermon was done. Micah 2, they said, prophesy ye not. He got done preaching. They basically said, stop preaching. A better rendering in the Hebrew is this. They said, shut your yapper, all right? (laughs) Yapper is Yiddish for your big fat mouth. They said, we don't want to hear you anymore, preacher man, prophet from God. We're really not that interested in what it is that you have to say. And not unlike today, at that time there were others, prophets, I'm putting in quotes, those who portrayed themselves as prophets, who they would only say what they knew the people would want to hear. They weren't interested in being lights, they just wanted to be liked, and they told the people what they wanted to hear. And friends, sometimes the truth is hard for us to hear, but we need to hear it nonetheless. And Micah was a faithful prophet of God. He had to spend time correcting the falsehoods from those false prophets, and he had to spend time sharing the truth. And sometimes the truth was pretty ugly. All right, a little bit of a background. In the time where Micah was ministering to God, Israel had gone through a civil war and been divided into two. The part in the north was called Israel. The part in the south was called Judah. Micah spent most of his time serving God in the southern part of Judah near Jerusalem where his, his hometown was. And, and he did take some time, however, to mention what God was going to do in the north. And here's one of the messages God told Micah to deliver to the people. He said, Micah, I want you to tell my people that because of their unfaithfulness, because they've walked away from me and from my truth, uh, they're going to go through a terrible time. They've put themselves in a position where enemies are going to come into the land and take them away captive. Micah took the time to tell those in the north, Israel, hey, it's coming. Guess what? He was a true man of God. He was a true prophet of God. So he gave the prophecy, and that's exactly what happened. In 721 B.C., the Assyrians came, conquered Israel, took them away as captives. And he told those living in Judah, hey, listen, that same thing that happened to them, it's going to happen to you too. And guess what? It did. Uh, It happened in 586. The Babylonians came. They didn't just conquer Judah. Again, they took these people away from the land. Israel's the only nation in the history of the world that's been dispossessed from their land twice and returned to their land twice. But this is what was happening. So he had to give that prophecy. Now, all of his prophecy was not bad news. Uh, Micah gives us some of the greatest prophecies in this book of the Bible, more than 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Micah tells us, hey, Jesus is going to be born. In fact, it was Micah that told us that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, let's start putting these pieces together. He said, guys, you're living in a day and age where people are drifting away from God. 
And yet he told them, I I want you to know that it's not all bad news. Jesus is coming. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Now I told you I'm kind of like Micah. Not exactly. I don't hear words from God. We just have the Bible. That's what we need today. But guess what I get to tell you week in and week out. Friends, we're living in a day and age where people are moving away from God. But Don't forget, Jesus is coming again. He already came to Bethlehem, but we too are looking towards the coming Savior just as those he was was preaching to. And and, uh, his, his audience was not unlike us in the regard. They needed that encouragement. And we know that Jesus is coming again, and we know the times that proceed is coming. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, it'd be a time when evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He said people are going to allure, entice people, give them deceptive messaging. Now, I'm excited. This fall, I'll be bringing a series of messages on the topic of Bible prophecy as it pertains to the end times. I'm going to call this series The Beginning of the End. I'm in depth in study for a series that begins, I think, October 17th, and I'm going to give you guys footnotes of what I'm learning. I'm going to share with you that the Bible has some crystal clear things to say about the end times that we need to understand. One of the greatest prophecies on the end time events that precede the return of Jesus Christ was given to us by Jesus Christ. It was a sermon we often call the Olivet Discourse, and it was given in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to take some time to get into that when that series comes. But in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said, if you like what Jesus said, say amen. Jesus said that there would be signs of the times preceding his second coming. He said they would be times of wars. Have any of you heard of any wars lately? rumors of wars. How about rumors of wars? We've been talking about what's happening in in, uh, Israel, what that could go into, and what's happening in the Ukraine and so forth. He said it would be a time of of famines, of pestilence, which which speaks of of major diseases. Can you say COVID? He said there would be an increase in earthquakes and, and various locations of earthquakes. And he said it would be a time of great persecution for Christians. And Christians are the most persecuted people on the face of the earth. And and, uh, I'll show you that more definitively when the series come. So here we are stuck in an increasingly tough time and we're looking forward to the occasion of the return of Jesus Christ. So the question that Micah knew needed to be addressed to those in his day and it applies to us in this day is, okay, so what do we do now? We're in a messed up world that's getting more messed up by the moment and we're waiting on the return of our Savior. What are we to do right now? And so Micah, under the inspiration of God, said, I've got an answer for you and it's Micah chapter six and verse eight and it's the hit single we need to learn today and memorize today and if you're with me and you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing out of respect for the reading of God's word. All right, Micah chapter Six and verse eight. The Bible says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. I want you to look right in the middle of that verse, that line, What doth the Lord require of thee? God lets us know what it is He wants of us in a time like this. Father, we're thankful for your word. Thank you for a man like Micah that listened to you and then boldly spoke what you gave him to say. Lord, I pray similarly we would would listen to your Bible that you've given us so that we can live it. Teach us in this time of Bible study today. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Two facts. Two facts I need everybody to understand before we jump into our Bible study today, okay? Two facts. Fact number one, Jesus is coming again. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Now, somebody could ask us, listen, they've been saying that a long time. Why do you believe Jesus is coming again? And I would tell you, well, don't take my word for it. Let's take his word for it. Jesus said very clearly in John 14, he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So fact number one, uh, I believe Jesus is coming again. That's fact number one. Got to get that down. Fact number two. I have no idea when Jesus is coming again. I don't know when. Now, I I told you that. Those are two things that are true, two facts. I want to tell you, I I do believe he's coming again soon. 
Now, nobody knows. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 25. He said, watch therefore, for you know uh, neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Jesus said, listen, you, you're, you're not going to know the day. You're not going to know the hour of my coming. But I told you, I do believe he's coming. And, and I acknowledge I don't know when he's coming. But I want you to know that personally, I believe the return of Jesus Christ is imminent. That's a word that means it could happen at any moment. I want to tell you today, I firmly believe that within my lifetime, Jesus will keep his word and his promise and will come again. Now, my granddad believed that same thing. And he's in heaven. He thought Jesus would come again in his lifetime. He, he didn't. He met Jesus by way of the undertaker, not the overtaker, okay? Uh, we're all going to get to heaven if we know the Lord, but he thought that. And I think that Jesus is going to come in my lifetime. Now, this is what I want you to understand. That's something I have in common with the first century Christians. As they watched Jesus ascend back to heaven to the right hand of the throne of God, they, they all to a person thought, well, surely he's going to come back. He promised, and surely he's going to come back in our lifetime. And of course, that didn't happen. You see, the fact is Christians throughout the ages have often endured difficult times, and in the midst of their difficult times, they thought, well, this must be it. Surely he'll come now. He, he said it would be tough before my coming. Things are difficult. This must be it. Jesus is coming back now. I've seen this a lot of times in even my lifetime. Uh, I remember growing up in the 80s. How many of you were alive in the 80s? Good. These are my old friends, all right, my old friends. And uh, they, Human history peaked in the 80s. It just got no better than, than the 80s. And uh, I digress. That's not in my notes. But there was a book that came out in the 80s. It was entitled this, 88 Reasons Jesus Will Come in 1988. Spoiler alert. He didn't come in 1988. The first Gulf War happened. This is it. This is the big one. He's coming. He didn't come. He didn't come after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He didn't come after the second Gulf War. Now, don't. Don't get what I'm saying wrong. I already told you, fact number one, Jesus is coming again. Fact number two, I don't know when he's coming. But Christians have had a way of looking for Jesus when times have been tough. This happened in the 1500s through the life of a man, kind of a complicated guy, a guy by the name of Martin Luther. He was an interesting guy. He studied to become an attorney, got through that, and they thought, no, I, I want to be a priest. And so he studied for the priesthood, and then he became a priest, and then he was promptly excommunicated from the church for, and I'm quoting now, for believing that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I got to tell you, I agree with him on that. Uh, that's his Bible right there. And so he becomes a priest, and then he starts declaring this message. Salvation is, is not found through a church. It's found through Jesus. It's, it's faith, God's grace and faith in Christ. And, and they said, you've got to get out of here. So he's now excommunicated from the church. He then marries a former nun. I mean, that probably doesn't happen every day. Former priest meeting a former nun. Hey, let's get married. And, and, and in time, he becomes the foremost figure in a, in a transformative moment in world history that reshaped everything known as the Reformation. And, and again, I don't hold to all his views. He, he was, however, a massive figure in Christianity. D during his time, uh, the Muslim Turks, the Ottomans, they were coming in and they were threatening Europe. And, and uh, so those in Europe, they're very upset by this. And Martin Luther was in Europe at this time. And, and people began to ask him, do, do you think this means the Lord's coming? Because this is scary. And, and we have the threat of an attack. This probably means the end is near. And, and so Martin Luther was asked the question, what would you do if you thought the world was ending and Jesus was coming tomorrow? I loved his reply. He said, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. Now listen, he wasn't advocating that we take up gardening. He was trying to make a point. If I thought Jesus was going to come back tomorrow, I would just, I would just do today what it is he wants me to do today. I, I would just live my life each day from, from this time to that time as I believe he would want me to live. And friends, that's what we should do. Do what God wants us to do each day. I think the reply that Martin Luther gave is very similar to what Micah gave us in Micah 6, 8. The question could have been asked, okay, Micah, judgment's coming. We've walked away from God, but he's going to come and change the world. What should we do? And Micah 6, 8 is the answer. In this time in which we're living between our unraveling world and our coming Savior, we need to answer, what doth the Lord require of thee? God, what is it you've called me to do? What is it that you want my life to be comprised of? 
Now I want you to go back to the beginning of the verse because this is very hopeful and encouraging to me. The Bible says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. In other words, what it is we need to know so that we can live for God. He has shown us. He's revealed it to us. God in his word tells us what it is we need to know. But what Micah does is he says, I'll tell you what. Let me take a very big subject like what are you going to do with your life and let me boil it down to three very concise, understandable thoughts that you can apply to any life and it'll make an impact. And through the power of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, these words come out, and Micah tells us what we need to know. What are we going to do in between our time and that time? Here it is. Number one, just taking the words in the verses that come. Do justly. Do justly. If you're still with me, say amen. This expression, do justly, as it's used in this text, I'm not speaking of the biblical doctrine of justification or of being made right through faith by Jesus Christ. I'm talking about doing things according to the definition of this term, that are morally right. Of evaluating a situation this way. What would God have me to do in this situation? That's what doing justly is all about. God, I want to do this your way. Help me. I want to follow you. And I think it's important that we understand he he didn't say be just. He said do justly. This is something you do. I think of the old saying, your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. I think all of us can talk a big game. But God's saying, listen, I'm not calling you to life of just bravado, chest thumping, telling everybody how good you are. I want you to put this to practice. I want you to live your life evaluating every decision on the basis of God. What would you have me to do here? What is the right thing? And it's so important that our ideas of right and wrong go back to God's word because we all have it in in us to hijack, to manipulate a word like justice. And we can redefine it as vengeance. Is vengeance. Revenge. In other words, we become the judge. We take the place of God. That's not what this text is teaching. What God is communicating is that it's his, his will for our lives to do the right thing. There are a good number of people in the Bible that are referred to as just. And I think one of the examples I love the most is the stepfather of Jesus Christ, Joseph. The Bible emphatically says he was just. And I love that. Now, in time, obviously, he came to understand that Jesus Christ is God the Son. He was born of a virgin, but he didn't know that at first. So he receives word, hey, Mary's going to have a baby. He's like, Mary's going to have a baby. It's not my baby. And uh, we're we're betrothed. We're we're to be married. Legally, they were already in a marriage contract. The ceremony hadn't happened. And, And listen, the only thing he could have thought is, she's been unfaithful to me. She cheated on me. That was the only thing he could have thought. In time, he learned who Jesus was. So he's evaluating this, and again, all he could have thought is, she's done me wrong. She lied to me. She's been unfaithful. I've got only two choices. One, I can make this as public and as ugly and as nasty as it could possibly be, and maybe that'll make me feel better for how she's hurt me. That's what I'll do. I'll I'll, I'll make it as tough on her as I possibly can. Then he thought, well, there's another option. I can just try to do really the right thing and just... Let it go. Be gracious to her. She's got her own things to deal with. I love the way the Bible speaks of this in Matthew 1. The Bible says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily or privately. He thought, you know something? I've got options here. I could could put her through the ringer. That even fit in with the uh, the legal system of the time. He, he had that right, so to speak, but he said, you know, uh, I, I want to do the right thing in the eyes of God, and I'm just going to be compassionate towards her. Now, let's not get this twisted today. Uh, I'm applying this verse to you and, and, and to me. We know in a society there has to be laws, there has to be a legal system, there has to be a justice system, I'm not talking about when people commit crimes, we let them go. I'm talking about us and our interpersonal relationships. We good on that? I I want you to know, if you don't enforce laws in a society, you're going to have absolute chaos. And and I look at so many of the cities in this wonderful country that we love that are going down the tubes, and it's because they're district attorneys that seem to have more sympathy for the criminals than for those who are on the receiving end of crime, and that causes crime to increase. 
just like throwing money into an economy creates inflation, it, that's just how it happens. That's the only way. That's how crime increases. You, you go light on it. So we're not talking about dealing with crime in a society. I'm talking to you and to me today. God is saying by do justly, we ought to have the kind of heart that when we look at things happening in our life, the question is, God, how would you have me to handle this? What's the right thing to do here? Now, there is a sign in our lives of mature faith. I want you to get this. One sign of a mature faith is someone who makes a much bigger deal of their responsibilities than of demanding their rights. That's a sign of a mature person who looks at a situation and thinks, what's my responsibility here? What should I do? How can I handle this? Now, thank God for rights. I'm not against rights. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's more of a man or more of a woman that says, what's the right thing to do here? What are my responsibilities? And that's the way we should look at it. Listen, if we want to do justly, we need to look at life through the eyes of God and say, God, what would you have me to do? That's the first thought. Number one, what do we do between now and then? Do justly. Number two, love mercy. Love mercy. If we're still friends, say amen. amen. All right. Talked about the criminal justice system. Some of you got nervous on me. All right, love, mercy. Now, the word mercy, let me give you the, the definition, okay? Compassion or forgiveness shown toward someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. It's similar to do justly, and we'll contrast that a bit more in a moment, but this is about giving compassion, specifically forgiveness. The, the word mercy used here, it includes all that I just mentioned, but it comes from a very specific Hebrew word. Yes, it means compassion, it means forgiveness, but, but specifically the nuance in Hebrew is it speaks of loyalty or faithfulness. Here's the idea. The idea is this, we'll live lives that don't just show mercy, we love to show mercy. We love it. And it's because we're loyal and faithful, not just to the one to whom we're given that mercy, our loyalty and our faithfulness goes back to our God. I like how Paul said it in Ephesians 4, verse 32. He said, be kind one to another, tenderhearted. And he, he talked about uh, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Paul said, listen, forgive each other. You know, like God forgave you. I like how Jesus spoke of this in Luke 6. Jesus said, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Those who truly love mercy have the power to change a life. They have the power to change a life. And we need to look at it that way. During the Revolutionary War, there was a Baptist pastor by the name of Peter Miller. He lived in a town called Ephrata, Pennsylvania. And turned out one of his best friends in all the world was General George Washington. They were just great friends, great friends. Well, there was another man that lived in that same town where uh, Peter Miller's home was, and his name was Michael Whitman. And that guy, Michael Whitman, did everything he could to just oppose that pastor, to humiliate him. He was kind of a perpetual pain in the neck. He had it in for this pastor and was just mean to him. I know it's hard for you to believe someone would be mean to pastors. I've heard it's happened before, okay? And it was happening to this pastor. This guy was just being mean to him, mean to him, uh, uh, horrible. Well, come to find out, this, this guy, Whitman, this, this cantankerous guy, he was arrested for treason. And he was going to be sentenced to death. And Pastor Miller heard of this. It was taking place at a trial in Philadelphia, 70 miles away. And he walked 70 miles to attend the trial of this man who had done everything he could just to be a total pain in his neck. And as it turns out, it's his good friend, General George Washington, presiding over the hearing in this case. And, and so he stands and, and he appeals to George Washington and he asks for this man, his enemy, if you would, to be let go. George Washington said this, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. Now, I think what he was saying there is, I've got a case here, but more than that, there's this sense of, look, I know we're friends, but I'm not going to let this guy go just because we're friends. I'm going to do the right thing here, which good for him for looking at it that way. When George Washington said that, the pastor said, friend, he's the most bitter enemy I have. And when the pastor said that, history records that General Washington said this. He said, you walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I'll grant your pardon. 
that day, the pastor and his bitterest enemy started a 70-mile walk. That would have taken him a couple days at least. I don't know what they're using for transportation, if they were walking or riding, but uh, they had a long trip to make together. And, and they say that as they traveled, they talked, and when they got home, they arrived not as enemies, but as friends. Why? Because one guy, he loved mercy. He loved it. He didn't love that guy first. No, 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 no. But he said, I love God. And in between this time and that time, I want to do justly, and I want to make sure that I, I love mercy. Those who love mercy make everywhere they go better just because they're there. Those of you in this room right now that you know what I'm talking about, and you in your heart, you love mercy, I want you to know every room you walk in, it gets a bit brighter just because you stepped in. And some of the rest of us, we carry a dark cloud with us where we go, and God needs to take this thought and put it in our hearts He's saying, hey, in between this unraveling world and a coming Savior, oh, man, do justly, love, mercy. Here's the third part, number three. If you're ready for another one, say amen. amen. He said, walk humbly with thy God. Walk humbly with thy God. You know, sometimes as Christians, we use a language. No one else knows what we're talking about. It's like we have our, our own dialect or our own vernacular, and we say things, and I think we probably shouldn't do that if there's a better word, but there are going to be times where we're going to come across a Bible word or a Bible expression that people don't understand. So I'll tell you what I'll do when that happens. I'll go ahead and use God's word, and then we'll just define it and describe it, okay? And sometimes we talk about walking with God, and I think there are a lot of people, they're like, what in the world? What, is, what does that mean, walking, walking with God? The Bible here says we're to walk humbly with thy God. It, it's the idea of fellowship in our life, of a relationship in our life. In fact, the word used here for humbly, it's used exactly one time in the Bible, and this is it. It's a specific word. It, it means humbly, for sure, but, but it means modesty. It means an appropriate esteem of self. And we walk with God through our life, by fellowshipping with him through reading the Bible, through prayer, through recognizing his presence in our world and in our lives. But you know, there was a man in the Bible who literally walked with God. And it's kind of one of the things he's known for. His name was Enoch. And Enoch scheduled time every single day to make sure he was walking with God. He wanted to hear from God. He wanted to talk with God. He wanted to enjoy the presence of God. And in fact, the Bible tells us that one day Enoch was walking with God and talking with God and hearing from God. And boom, he was just translated, the Bible says. He just left this earth, went into the presence of God. He didn't die like, like uh, everyone else at that point had done. And, and maybe, just maybe, he's one of the prophets we're going to study about in our end time series that, that comes back to preach the Bible during the time we call the tribulation. Could be, but we'll talk about that later. But anyhow, Enoch is a man that's walking with God. Genesis 5, says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begot sons and daughters. Enoch walked with God. He had, he had a son, Methuselah, and he had more sons and daughters, and he walked with God. Listen, Enoch was the kind of guy that didn't say, Man, I've got all these kids to raise. I've got a job to get to. I'm very busy. I just don't know if I have time for God today. I don't know if I have time for church this Sunday. I'm pretty busy, you know. No, Enoch was a bright man. He was smart enough to say, with everything I've got to get done in life, and I want to do it all to the very best of my ability for the glory of God, I'd better make some time for God today. I better make time to give God his day, the Lord's day. And that was his heart. He walked with God. Later in the New Testament, we find a mention of Enoch in the chapter we often call the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Listen to what the Bible says of him there. Hebrews 11 says, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was, and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony. Here, here was his testimony, his life. The Bible says he pleased God. He pleased God. Now, I'm not talking about being accepted of God. Our acceptance by God is based on, on the work of Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you today, uh, imagine, imagine God looking over the banister of heaven, looking down and seeing you walking humbly, modestly, in appropriate sense of self, who you are in him. And our father's the kind who would see one of his children doing that and going, man, that makes me happy. That pleases me right there. I'm pleased when I see that. That's what I like. And that's what happened in Enoch's life. And I love how each of these aspects, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Um, it, it's, it's more than putting on a show. God didn't say, be just. He could have said that. He's God. He can say whatever he wants. He didn't say that. He said, do justly. 
He didn't just say, uh, be merciful. He said, love it. I mean, don't begrudgingly give out that mercy. Love it. Love it. Be passionate about it. And, and walk humbly with God, a God who can truly see our heart. There's an author. His name is David Brooks. And he wrote an article for a periodical called The Atlantic. That's not important. But his article I just thought was interesting. Let me give you the title of this article. The title is Truly Humbled to be the author of this article. Okay? That's the title. And uh, it, it's an interesting article. I would like to take time to read it all, but I won't do that. But it was an article that showed how modern humility, modern humility has become the new pride. We're proud of our humility. And he gave an example to demonstrate what it would look like if we were proud of our humility. And he took a tweet, uh, or what is it called now? It's not... A, X, he took an X or whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. He took one of those things from the president of the European Central Bank. You guys with me? So we got a big, important guy. And so now he's on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. And listen to what he puts there. He said, I was humbled to be awarded an honorary degree by the London School of Economics this week. Thank you so much for this prestigious honor. So the author of the article, he went on to say this. He said, never tweet about an event that could have actually led to humility. He said, never use the word humbled when the word proud would have been more accurate. And never use a personal pronoun to start a tweet. I think he had some pretty keen insights there. We all have it in us to act humbly without truly being humble. But the thing with God is he sees all the way through us, man. He, he sees not just what we do. He sees the motivation that leads to that which we do. And when we're walking through life, abiding with God in his word and prayer, enjoying his presence, he'll lead us along. Now, let me tell you about my message today. It was simple, right? I mean, I read a verse. I'll tell you, I got out a dictionary and looked every word up and told you what they meant. Simple, right? It was. Simple message. I mean, my points were just the words out of the verse. Simple. But I think we all know it was not simplistic. You know what we covered today? We covered the essence of the Christian life. What we covered today in a few words by way of this prophet is my lifelong work. This is what I'm trying to put the work in my life. It's the Christian life. So I'm living in a world that's unraveling, more so every moment, and I'm awaiting the return of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I'm in this tension between the two, and I see people who are doing things that I know clearly it's not right, and you know what I want to do in my flesh? I want to fight with them. I want to argue with them. I think, good night. I mean, do you not have a calculator? Do you have no sense of reason? What is your problem? I want to get after him. Now, clearly, we need to stand for truth. If you've heard me preach more than once, you know that I, I'm there with you all the way. We must boldly and courageously stand for truth. And I'll tell you this, the more intense it gets on Christians, as Jesus said it would, some people are just going to back away. They're not going to want that stigma that comes with being a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do my best to insert some steel in your spine by way of the word of God. We've got to stand for truth. But I think Jesus would tell us, as you're standing for truth, there is an effective way to do that. Do justly. Love mercy. I mean, love it. And walk humbly. A sense of, of modesty. An appropriate sense of self. Imagine with me today if those words actually describe my life or your life. I wonder what would happen. I'm guessing I'd enjoy stronger relationships in my life because honestly, who wouldn't want to spend time with someone that does justly and loves mercy and walks humbly? I, I, I'd probably be a better husband, better dad, better granddad, better friend, better pastor, all of it. Imagine. Probably a greater sense of joy. I think we make a greater impact for the cause of Jesus Christ. I love it. Micah, Micah I, I don't think we were in his mind, us, this service right now when he wrote those words, but man, he was talking to us, wasn't he? He said, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do. Just do the right thing. Be 
kind and compassionate and forgiving to others and walk in humility. In between this time and that time. Our Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us be faithful to follow you. God, I pray that there would be a an authentic spirit found in our lives as individuals and in the life of our church. No arrogance, no pride. Lord, I pray we'll boldly stand for that which is right. Not God, I know we're going to be absolutely despised for just simply believing basic Bible truth more and more as time goes on. But, but I pray that we'll take the right position with the right disposition. I pray that our convictions would, would be equal in stature to our compassion. Help us, Lord, to do what you've required. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.